Bite of the Greasy Dead by Mac Ralston It was such a simple order. Two number twos, a number nine with honey mustard, and a bitey kid's meal. It was so simple, in fact, that I didn't even bother to notice who ordered it. A person. An actual person. Not just any person. Bruce. Big Bruce, as we called him. I was about to correct him when he apologized and did it himself. He's been here enough times to know that we don't serve number twos anymore. It's even crossed off with spray paint on the menu sign. And even if we did, I'm not sure Big Bruce needed two of them anyway. Okay, forget the number twos. My bad. I'll just stick with the number nine and the body kid's meal. You got kids, Bruce? Yeah, asked through my headset. There was a little delay before he responded. Nah, but... He stopped himself, clearing his throat. I, uh... Collect the toys. He admitted, somewhat embarrassed. It reminds me when I used to come here with my dad, before... He was infected? Y yeah. I'm sorry, Bruce. Uh, first window for me, okay? I watched Bruce nod through the drive through cameras as he pulled up around my window. 770, I said, taking Bruce's cash from him. How have you been, Bruce? Fine, brother. You? I've been good. How's, uh, what's your name? I glanced across the kitchen to the other window, watching Tina push open the zero contact window towards a customer. I turned back to Bruce. Tina, I said. She's fine, thanks. I smiled, extending my arm through the side window with his bag, grease staining the brown paper that sagged at the bottom. I pray to God that one day y'all get those bitey burgers back. It's killing me, man. I know. Corporate teased the idea, maybe doing a veggie option or something. But they don't want to risk another outbreak, you know? I don't blame him, brother. I should really cook back myself, but sometimes we need our comfort foods. He smiled nodding as he pulled away into the night. I bid Big Bruce a farewell wave before turning to the drive through camera again. Empty, as usual. Bruce was right, you know? We'd get more business from actual people if we had more actual food. I get the mad cow really restricts the burger and dairy options, but there's gotta be more fast food aside from cheeseburgers, right? What do lactose intolerant people eat for crying out loud? See, most of the time it's not actual people that walk through our drive through Call them the infected, walkers, flesh eaters, biters, or the obvious. Zombies. Corporate is very strict about us calling them one thing and one thing only. Customers. Our so-called customers started showing up four weeks after the first reports of the massive outbreak. Now, if you've watched any horror movies, you might wrongly assume these things to be the living dead. They're not. Brain dead, perhaps, but these are infected individuals. We never imagined that BSE could transfer through meats or milk products, but here we are. The world's a different place now, and we had to adapt. Look, I've seen some shit. Literally, too. Like that dookie some idiot dropped in the sink in the men's room. But not even that could have prepared me for what happened on week five. It was horrible. And that's even an understatement. Literal corpses lining the floor of our dining room. Blood splattered all over the walls and ceiling. And those screams. Those awful screams. I admit... I took this job for the minimum wage and the chance to work alongside Tina, but after seeing what I saw, the 15 bucks an hour didn't come close to compensating. But thank God I have this job, because there aren't many left. We were this close to bombing the shit out of ourselves, total atomic annihilation. They were going to corral survivors into bunkers and obliterate the nation from here to kingdom come, but plans changed all of a sudden. Some scientists found out the reason for the widespread attacks orchestrated by the infected was due to a specific compound in the brain. 
I guess the biters really liked whatever was in them. So, the worldwide governments began pumping the stuff out, manufacturing it, claiming it was chunks of cow brain from all the millions of inedible cattle around the world. A few backdoor handshakes later, and, well, we have where we're at now. Every fast food chain was approached with this billion dollar idea, hand out samples of compound to the infected and receive financial compensation. We don't have an exact dollar figure still, but it must have been a lot, because they all immediately adopted the program within weeks. Every couple of days, we get shipments of compound patties at our back door. Now, they claim it's cow brains, but after we forced our lead shift manager to watch Soylent Green, he's convinced the stuff's made out of dead people, and we've been placing our bets ever since. Regardless of their content, however, the compound patties go like hotcakes for the infected. They can't get enough. And because they're so busy eating the patties, they've got no reason to attack people. Thus, crisis solved. Right? I work at this place called The Bite. It's not as well known as the big name chains, but we keep busy. Essentially, we're McDonald's mixed with checkers. Or rallies if you survived out in the Midwest. God help you. In the sense that our drive through is split in half, with one side devoted to genuine fast food, and the other for... well... the zombies. Tonight, Tina's on compound duty, while I've got the regular drive side. We're hounded up the ass to keep the sides separated to avoid cross-contamination. We do our best, but I can't help but visit with Tina on and off. Aside from us, there's Dennis, our shift manager, Rebecca, our lobby cashier, George, our lead cook, and Chuck, the GM, who happened to surprise us tonight with a routine evaluation, which has Dennis, Mr. Employee of the Month, shaking in his non-slip boots. Personally, and honestly, I'm not very concerned. It's Thursday. Thursdays are never busy. Oh, shit. Dennis said, wrapping a tight fist around his chain as he bit down onto his knuckle. What? I asked. He pointed to the drive through camera behind me, showcasing Tina's drive through side. One hell of a line. And by line, I mean mass horde of the infected. Did I mention that on the compound side, it's always busy? I went with Dennis to grab another frozen box of patties from the freezer, being sure to wash my hands, as I was told. Cause God knows, that's helping. But I stopped when he noticed that Chuck had beat us to it. He looked worried, those calculating eyes of his darting around as trembling fingers gripped onto that company phone. I mean, he was standing in a freezer, but he looked more jittery than usual. Dennis, a word please. He said, looking at me and prompting my excusal. I shrugged Dennis off, turning back to the kitchen where George met me with his eyes. The hell's going on? I'm out of patties. I know, I said. They're having a meeting or something. In the freezer? I nodded. I wasn't going to interrupt my higher ups, even if they were running low on inventory. After all, it's pretty stupid that we even bothered to cook these things in the first place. Our customers clearly don't care. Corporate said it was something about keeping up appearances, or something. The freezer door popped open with a metallic clank after a long, foreboding silence. Neither George nor I mustered up the audacity to say anything. Chuck then marched right past us in a beeline from the freezer in a tizzy, leaving Dennis in his dust. He approached us, not saying a word. So? I said, trying to read his face. It was a blend of surprise and sheer panic. He opened his mouth, but nothing came out. Spit it out, man! George said. You got the patties or not? Tina's running low and I'm all out. The truck... It tipped over. What truck? The truck full of patties. He said as matter-of-factly as he could have. The driver took a sharp turn and it tipped. Within seconds, it was swarmed by a mob of Roman biters. Dennis shook his hand, his thoughts catching up with his mouth. He shot himself. The driver... Before they could get to him. Hold the phone, George said, resting his spatula against the hot metal with a fading sizzle. 
You're telling me we ain't get any more patties because some jackass took a wrong turn on the I-95? The hell are we supposed to do now? Sit tight, Dennis said, refusing to make eye contact with either of us. Sit tight? <laughs> Is that what corporate said? Man, fuck corporate, man. The realization of the situation finally dawned on me, physically pushing me back before I could speak. So we're just supposed to sit here? I asked, unsure of what to say. Chuck said there's a protocol for this. Dennis said, folding his arms and lowering his voice. He also said they're going to come for us, Stephen. Come for us? Without the patties, they'll be forced to seek after any available, well, brains they can smell. Namely, ours. It was at this point we were interrupted by Tina, who was attempting to appease the growling crowd outside a window. George, where the hell are those burgers? I've got dozens of hungry customers waiting. George chuckled with a wave of his hand, tearing his hair net from what little hair remained atop his scalp. There's been a menu change, honey. And we're all on it. Wait, what? She snapped. Just everyone calm down, all right? There's a protocol in place for our safety. Dennis said, Sullivan nodding towards us underneath that You are not replaceable sign plastered beneath the red-eyed security cameras. He shot his gaze over to Chuck, who was still preoccupied with his extended phone call. Right, Chuck? Chuck looked up from his call with a blank expression. He clearly wasn't reading the situation. We've got a protocol in place, correct? Dennis reiterated. Chuck didn't say a word, and instead of replacing his silence, merely placed a finger over his poised limbs. The hell is that about? Extending a finger at the one crossed over Chuck's mouth. At this point, a commotion prompted Rebecca to stroll into the picture, who really didn't do very much, given the fact our lobby hadn't seen an ounce of life for over three months. Her job was probably another one of those, keeping up appearances, charades of our corporate overlords they seemed to love so much. Basically, they were paying her to play games on her phone. Can someone please tell me why it's so damn loud right now? Jeez. We all stopped our bickering and realized Rebecca was right. Even without our raised voices, it was loud. Outside. There must have been at least a hundred of infected out there. Of course, the glass drive through window behind Tina only showcased a good handful or so. But from every corner of the building, we could make out the groans and cries of the flesh eaters their bodies flailing against the walls of the building as thuds echoed throughout our tiny kitchen. We all instinctively looked over at the camera feed, watching straggling biters roam off the main highway and into the mob, which looked like a bunch of roaches, something we used to hear. The sound of the glass shattering sent the group into a type of shared paralysis. None of us could move, and even if we could, where would we go? The pitter-patter of spongy feet across the lobby floor sent me into a type of fight or flight I'd never experienced before. I scrambled toward the fire extinguisher, yanking it from the wall and aiming the nozzle into the stagnant darkness of the lobby. I felt the eyes of everyone else, including Chuck, burning into the back of my head, drilling thoughts into me and telling me I was crazy. I was. After what seemed like a year of waiting, a face emerged from the blackness. A mangled, pudgy, corpse-like face. It was that of a large man, his body pulsating with a vile stench of greasy oil and decayed flesh. Flesh that hung from his dark face, oozing with pus that seeped out of every pore. I didn't hesitate to spray the shit out of him, and when the extinguisher did little to deter the infected, I gripped the nozzle and began beating the zombie with everything I had. Once I landed several blows on top of the mangled head, the zombie fell, limp, onto the floor. The inside of the building was now completely silent, aside from my non-slip sneakers as they crept up to the body, lying face up with white, hazy eyes reflecting the dimly fluorescent ceiling. I kicked the side of it once to make sure it was dead. It was, or at least, dead enough. The sound of something clinking against the hard flooring broke my panting. I bent down, 
pinching my nose hard as the oozing, bile-like smell continued to fill my nostrils. It was a toy. One of our plastic toys from the bitey kid's meal. It must have fallen out of one of the zombies' pockets when I kicked it. I instinctively shot my glance to the unconscious face below me. I must have not recognized him due to the decay. It was Big Bruce. Okay, what the hell? I shouted, turning to Chuck and Dennis for answers, because at this point I severely needed some. Chuck raised his hands in innocence, lowering them for me to calm down, though he knew we were all tired of his silence by this point. You got five seconds to start talking, George said. Chuck sighed. I'm gonna get so fired for this, but what the hell? Chuck said, lowering his defenses and breaking his silence. Being fired is going to be the last of your problems, man, George said. Chuck nodded stillly. The Bidey Corporation received a large sum of money from the U.S. government. How large? George snapped. I don't know. Pretty damn large. They did some company-wide data analysis and realized they were better off post-outbreak, especially compared to our competitors. So? So... He said, breathing in heavily before he spoke. So they started putting shit in the food. What kind of shit? I don't know. Bullshit. Tallow. They started using beef fat for the oil. Chuck admitted. I watched as George's face contorted from rage to a frightening realization. He looked back at me. Then at the others. Then Chuck. So... You're telling me we've been turning people into zombies? Chuck nodded, looking down at the floor. There was a staggering group sigh as we all realized what was going on. I looked up at Tina, perhaps the only safe one through all of us, given the fact that, ironically, she didn't eat meat. The rest of us, though, were screwed. How come it didn't work on Bruce until tonight? I said, pointing at the body before us. They just implemented the new strategy, Chuck said, shaking his head. Only the newest shipment had the beef oil on it, that's why. George let out another sigh, as heads continued to snap from face to face, eyes locking and unlocking. So what's the plan now? What's this protocol? The protocol is we hang tight. The cops have been dispatched, but the only road to this location... Here's the road where the semi flipped, Dennis nodded. So you're saying we're fucked, George said. We all realized we were. The only way we could buy some time was to... No, we couldn't. I looked around at the others. I wasn't alone in my thought process. What are you all looking at? Chuck asked with a raised defensive voice. George nodded at us and grabbed him by the arm. If I'm going, George said affirmatively, you're going too, you son of a bitch. What are you talking about? We're supposed to hang tight, George asked. In case you didn't notice, we've got a hole the size of Texas through the front window. They'll be coming in any second. George began dragging the lightweight Chuck through the kitchen. He turned to face us amid Chuck's cries for help. If any of you have eaten here since the last shipment, I suggest you follow us. At least you'll die with some dignity. George nodded a goodbye as he pulled Chuck through the opening in the glass window. I prompted Dennis to follow me as we upturned the handful of tables and barricaded the hall. As we shoved the tables in place, one by one, we could hear the trill screams of Chuck and George, followed by silence for a moment, before the tearing of skin and snapping of bones resonated from the parking lot outside. We both queasily winced at the noises, gritting our teeth and baring it as we turned to Tina and Rebecca in the kitchen. Both of the girls quickly adopted the terror plastered on each of our faces. I could tell they wanted us to comfort them or offer some reassurance, but both of us stood without a word. That is, of course, before the inevitable arose. Who's next? Another loud crash jolted us all from our silent stairs, mine toward Tina, 
and the others towards the floor, stained with rancid blood oozing from Bruce's wounds. Time was running out, and the lack of sirens meant we were still on our own. The inhuman and disfigured voices chanted in unison around the walls of the small building, all reprising their collective request of brains. All right, who's next? I said, sucking back a gasp of air and holding it tightly within my chest. The gazes from the others met mine, none in shock, as if we all had the same idea. We can draw straws, Dennis said. There's some in the lobby. You'd like that, wouldn't you? You're the one who got us into this shit, Dennis. You ought to go first. Me? I... He paused, noticing he was outnumbered. He slowed his voice. I didn't do anything. Chuck merely asked that I keep quiet as not to scare you all. I had no idea about the beef, I swear. Maybe it was the fact the brink of death was so close, but for whatever reason, I believed him. Obviously, Tina did too. Straws, then, Tina said. I nodded, hemming back a raspy cough as I stepped over Bruce's lifeless body on the floor, retrieving a handful of straws from the lobby. I felt a shiver run up my spine as I turned to face the glass window behind me. There were more of them. The infected studied me with wide eyes, ripping from their sockets without lids to hold them back. Their tongues glued to the chilled glass, hazed with hot breath, they had laughed. I swallowed a warm mouthful of spit as I turned to the others with the straws. Tina cut them up with one of George's kitchen knives. We all watched as she scrambled the various lengths around in a balled-up fist, unable to tell the difference between them. She held out her hand and waited. None of us dared to start. Screw it. I grabbed a straw. Somewhat on the taller side. I was safe. Tina immediately followed. The largest. Thank God. Then Rebecca. She reached in, yanking the smallest out. Shit, listen, you can't. She fearfully stared back at all of us. I'm pregnant. Nenis's mouth dropped open at that bombshell. I honestly didn't have a comeback for this one. Bullshit. Tina said, calling her bluff. It's true, Tina, Rebecca said, nodding spastically. How many weeks? Twenty. Boy or a girl? Girl. Her answers were pretty snappy. If she was lying, she was doing a damn good job. And that's when the biter entered the picture. See, despite our bureaucratic straw-drawing debate, the crawlers outside were far less cordial. It didn't matter that we were deciding who would be their next meal. To them, all that mattered was that they got it. I don't know how he got in, but he did. Out of nowhere, this walker ran in and clasped his jaw unhinged like a snake, right down on top of Dennis's head, peeling some of his scalp off and cracking straight through his skull, spraying his blood all over that customer-is-always-right sign. We tried our best to pry the thing off of him, but our efforts were in vain. Tina rushed by me as she pulled the emergency exit door shut, Somehow, the biter must have figured out how to use a door handle. Rebecca then handed me the knife Tina used to cut the straws, and with one stab after another, I jammed the thing through the biter's face, causing it to spasm and gargle on its own blood until it, too, fell limp. Rebecca helped hoist me up to my feet, overlooking the mangled corpse on the kitchen floor. We were both silently waiting for the thing to twitch when that emergency back door began to rattle from behind Tina the squeals of the infected pushing their way through. Tina pounded on it as she screamed for them to stop. They didn't, of course. They kept slamming onto it, and I feared the cheapo door wouldn't be saving us for much longer. What now? Rebecca said, heaving with her chest. She looked at Tina and me back and forth. Now, Tina said, pulling the now red-bladed knife from the biter's face. You go outside, Becca. What? I said. What was Tina? Look at her, she said, staring intently. Does she look like she's twenty weeks pregnant? I don't know, I shrugged desperately. How am I supposed to know? Trust me, she's not. 
I am, you gotta believe me! Rebecca shouted. They're gonna burst through that door any minute, Tina said. And the cops still aren't here, so we're all gonna die if someone doesn't go outside. Dina held the knife up at Rebecca, who turned to face me. What happened to women and children first, huh? She cried. If you insist, Tina said, shouldering Rebecca towards the door, causing her to trip over the body on the floor. I took a step back as the ensuing catfight began, ending with Rebecca being pinned against the emergency exit at knife point. Sorry, Becca, Tina said as she unlatched the door, forcing Rebecca into a swarm of the infected. Her scream shot through the tiny kitchen until Tina slammed the emergency exit, muffling the shrill shrieks. Tina sighed against the fresh, not frozen beef sign, and pulled herself through the kitchen with what little energy she had left. Rebecca's screams cutting off, as it was probable they reached her vocal cords on the way to her brain. Everything became silent then, aside from the hum of perpetual moans that plagued the place, and the ice machine. Tina stood before me, wiping away a tear and sniffling. I sure hope she was lying to us. I nodded as I extended an arm, embracing her. You know, there's something I've never told you, Tina. What? She said, her voice muffled as her cheeks dug into my shoulder. It's nothing. No, go on. I swallowed. If somehow I get the chance, I want to take you out. I said. Tina laughed against me. Deal. Just as long as it's not fast food. I felt her smile widen against my arm. As I held on to her so tightly amid the cramped up kitchen, my nose atop her blonde locks, my lips pecking a kiss. The only thing running through my mind now was the taste of that number nine I had on my lunch break, and how it smelled just like the inside of her head. <laughs>